Uh, before we get started with the program, let me first check, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, good, okay. I want to give a, uh, Kate has just thanked a lot of important people without whom seminars would not be able to function. But I want to thank Kate herself on behalf of our entire board. Uh, she has been a fabulous chair. I can't tell you how hard she works. You see her up here at the podium, but she does a huge amount behind the scenes. And I was reading an article uh, recently about Ben Bernanke, who has been much in the news recently in terms of who's going to succeed him. And I think you may find each of our speakers uh, would be, might have an opinion on that if you want to ask them later. But you know, the point of the article was that Ben Bernanke was a consensus builder. And I think one of Kate's great strengths is that she is also a consensus builder and an institution builder. And will you join me in thanking her for her service? So as Kate has told you, we are going to talk today about taxes and tax reform, a really important topic, I think. Not only did Ben Franklin say that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes, but Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. Nobody likes taxes, nobody likes to pay them, but they are a necessity. Uh, I notice in the press of late that the two chairs of the two tax writing committees in Congress, uh, Max Baucus, the uh, senator uh, who chairs the Senate Finance Committee, and David Camp, who chairs the House Ways and Means Committee, they've been doing a road show around the country to try to, try to prepare the public for tax reform. And I think we're very privileged today to have a very special briefing on this from two of the most highly respected experts in the country uh, on this topic. Uh, according to the press, there may be a bill produced this fall, and already there may be staff uh, working on that. I think <clears throat> almost everyone agrees that the current tax system is broken, but there may be disagreements about how to fix it. I'm not going to introduce uh, Marty and Bill in any depth because you can read their bio in your program, but let me just say a couple of quick words about each. Uh, Marty teaches at Harvard. Uh, he's President Emeritus of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a very influential research organization, and he was the top economic advisor to President Reagan. Uh, Bill Gale is a colleague of mine at the Brookings Institution. He is co-director of something called the Tax Policy Center. I think it's just taxpolicycenter.org. It's a great go-to place for all kinds of great information on tax policy. Uh, both he and I have done a stint as vice president and director of economic studies at Brookings. Uh, he succeeded me and cleaned up all the messes that I made. <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, let me turn this over now to each of them. They're each going to make a 10 to 15 minute opening statement, and then we're going to have a discussion amongst the three of us. So Marty, let's begin with you. Great. Well, thanks very much. And uh, Belle, it's really a pleasure for me to be here in Steamboat Springs. I look forward to the discussion with you and Bill and also to the questions from this group. So although our specific subject is tax reform, I want to put it in a slightly broader context because we really have two key fiscal problems. The first is the tax system. The tax system creates bad incentives, incentives that reduce economic growth, and that lead to a wasteful use of our incomes. And, but we have a second problem closely related, and that is the large national debt. Half a dozen years ago, before the recession began, the national debt was about 35% of GDP. So about where it had been for a number of years before that. Since then, over those six years, it has doubled relative to GDP. So it's now about 75%. And although deficits have come down recently because of rising tax revenue, particularly the recent tax increases, 
the debt to GDP ratio remains at about 75%. And the Congressional Budget Office warns us that it will stay there for the rest of this decade and then start rising after that. The increase in the, the ratio of debt to GDP from 37% to 75% reflects a bunch of things. The fact that during the recession, tax revenue was reduced, that we had a series of stimulus packages that added a trillion dollars to the national debt, the rising cost of middle class entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare, and other things. And this rising debt is really dangerous, really harmful to our economy. And I think, therefore, it's an important background for whatever we say about tax reform. So tax reform can do two things. It can improve incentives, and it can reverse this increase in the ratio of our national debt to our gross domestic product. Now, there are many aspects of the tax system that need reform, but our time is limited, and so I'm not going to talk about a number of things like capital gains or estate and gift taxes, but we might come back to some of those with the questions. What I'll do instead is to start talking about the corporate income tax and then turn to the personal income tax. The corporate income tax collected about $240 billion last year, about a little more than 1.5% of GDP. There are many complex issues in reforming the corporate income tax, which is very much on the agenda for the two tax writing committees that Bell referred to. But the two key things are the high tax rate and the tax treatment of the profits of foreign subsidiaries of American companies. The corporate income tax rate in the United States is now 35%, higher than the rate in any other major industrial country. Add to that the taxes imposed on corporations by individual states, and the typical incremental tax rate, typical marginal tax rate paid by corporations is more than 40%. Now, there are special rules for depreciation and for inventory evaluation that lower, for many corporations, lower the overall effective tax rate. But the 40 plus percent tax rate is the one that companies face on many of the decisions that they deal with. Let me say a word about how foreign profits are taxed, because it's a critical issue for the American economy. Think about an American company that has a subsidiary overseas, say in Ireland. The Irish have a low corporate income tax rate because that attracts a lot of business to Ireland. Their tax rate's about 12%. So an American company that earns a profit there and pays 12% to the Irish government doesn't owe any more taxes if it leaves the funds, the after-tax funds, in Ireland or moves them anywhere else in the world except bringing them home to the United States. If it brings them home to the United States, it has to pay an extra tax, a tax equal to the difference between our federal tax rate, 35%, and the tax they've already paid, 12%. So that's a very strong incentive for American companies to leave their funds abroad, to invest them abroad, and not to bring them back to invest and create jobs in the United States. We are alone among all the industrial countries of the world in having that system. The others have what is called a territorial system. For example, a French company that invests in Ireland, after it pays the Irish 12% tax, if it wants to bring those funds back to France, it can do so by paying another small tax of about 5%. So there are very different incentives facing foreign companies and American companies. So this combination of high tax rates on corporations and our special tax rules for foreign profits have five serious adverse effects. First, it hurts investment in the United States relative to investing abroad. That reduces growth in the, U in the United States. That reduces job creation in the United States. Second, it increases the cost of funds to companies because they have to pay tax on them at those high rates. And that makes US companies less competitive in the global economy. 
Third, it leads companies to increase their use of debt because interest payments are deductible against this 40 plus percent marginal tax rate. And that increase in debt increases the riskiness of our economy. Fourth, it drives our nation's savings into unincorporated uses, particularly into housing, but also into other kinds of unincorporated businesses. And fifth, it encourages the use of so-called pass-through corporations, partnerships, limited liability companies, and the like, that give an unfair advantage to those kinds of businesses that are able to do that when many other businesses are not. So what to do about it? What's the right reform for the corporate income tax? What will the members of Congress be talking about? I think the answers are clear. First is to reduce the corporate income tax. And you could do that without losing revenue, without adding to the deficit and the national debt, by changing the special rules for depreciation, and the special rules for inventory evaluation. Those rules were really important when inflation rates were very high, 8, 10, 12 percent, but not when they're at 1 or 2 percent as they are now. The good news is that President Obama shares that view. And he has recently said he would like to see the corporate income tax brought down from 35% to 28%. He's been less explicit about how he would pay for it, but the two things that I mentioned, uh, I think, are on the table. The other problem is, what do we do about foreign, tax, uh, foreign profits? And I think there we should follow the rest of the world, adopt some form of territorial system, so that US firms can bring profits back, invest in the United States, create activity in the United States. The position of the administration on that is still, unfortunately, unclear. Let me turn from the corporate tax to the personal income tax. It's about five times as large as the corporate tax. Uh, last year, it collected uh, about $1.1 trillion, about 7.5% of GDP. The top rate has crept up so that it's now more than 40%, up from the 28% rate that we had in 1986 after President Reagan and Speaker O'Neill agreed on a bipartisan tax reform that brought tax rates down dramatically. And that 40 plus percent rate is just the federal rate. And then there are state rates on top of that, and in some cases, city rates on top of that. These high marginal tax rates have several adverse effects that we ought to be thinking about when we think about tax reform. First, it discourages work. It discourages the acquisition of skills, the creation of new businesses, the taking of risks. And that's particularly strong for second earners since their starting marginal tax rate is that of the first earner in the household. It also discourages saving and therefore the funds available for investment in this country. So those two effects have the impact of reducing our growth rate, also reducing taxable income, and therefore contributing to the large size of our deficit and our growing debt. High marginal tax rates of the sort that we have and our existing tax rules also encourage individuals to take income in non-taxable form. Fringe benefits of all kinds, nice offices, nice travel, uh, employer paid health insurance, are all ways of being nice to ourselves without having to pay tax on the benefits. If somebody's marginal tax rate is 40%, a dollar of cash income is only worth after tax 60 cents. So taking fringe benefits are worth worth doing as long as the value is greater than 60 cents. So that we waste a lot of resources, we waste a lot of potential in that way. High marginal tax rates in our rules also encourage spending on things that are tax deductible, mortgage interest, local taxes, and the like. Again, we're spending after tax dollars, we're spending 60 cent dollars, and therefore, um, leading us to make decisions that we wouldn't do if it weren't for 
these tax subsidies. Well, both of these things, excluding certain kinds of income and allowing deductions for certain kinds of expenses, reduce our taxable incomes, reduce tax revenue, and therefore make the deficit and the debt higher. Now, the most important thing I want to emphasize is that an important feature of our personal income tax code is that it creates a backdoor way of increasing government spending. Let me explain what I mean by that backdoor way of increasing government spending. If I buy a hybrid car like a Prius, the government wants to reward me, but it doesn't send me a check. Instead, it gives me a tax break. If I buy a solar panel, the government wants to reward me. It doesn't do that by sending me a check. It allows me a tax break. If I choose a more expensive form of uh, health insurance from my employer, I can exclude that from my compensation, my taxable compensation, and that reduces my tax bill. If I have a larger mortgage, then again, I get to deduct that higher interest, and that reduces my tax bill. So these things are called tax expenditures because they are spending by the government through the tax code. They show up in the budget as reduced revenue, but the economics is clear. In each case, this is an increase in government spending. Now, I believe that we have to reduce future deficits. We have to stop this uh, rapid growth of the national debt. And to do that, I think we have to reduce government spending. Now, the traditional on-budget forms of spending, both defense and non-defense, discretionary spending, other than the big entitlement programs, have already been squeezed down so that there's very little left to do. The growth of Social Security and Medicare are major sources of the growing deficit and debt in the future, and that's a subject for perhaps another day, but clearly that has to be dealt with if we're going to stop the explosion of the national debt. But reducing government spending can be done most effectively by going after the spending that is built into the tax code. And if that's done, we will see smaller deficits and smaller debt in the future. So the key question is how to do it. What's the best way to limit these tax expenditures? I think we simply cannot expect Congress to eliminate any of these major tax expenditures like the mortgage deduction or the deduction for state and local taxes or the exclusion of health insurance. It's just not politically possible to eliminate them. I think it's also not possible to single out one or two of these and say, well, we're going to cut this much here and we're going to cut that much there. People will then say, well, that's unfair. Why are you cutting my tax deduction more than his tax deduction? So my solution to the problem is to put an overall cap, an overall cap on the amount of the tax deduction that each individual can achieve by using tax expenditures. That is, with this reform, everyone would be able to continue to take the same major tax expenditures, the same deductions, the same exclusions as they do today, but they couldn't just be too greedy about it. Yet a cap like this could raise substantial amounts of revenue. And I've studied a variety of alternative caps using data that the Internal Revenue Service makes available to academics and other researchers. And let me just focus on one form of that that appeals to me. If we put a cap equal to 2% of adjusted gross income, total income, a 2% cap on the reduction in tax payments that taxpayers can get through deductions and exclusions. For example, if someone has an adjusted gross income of $150,000, they can reduce their tax payments by 2% of that, or $3,000. So if their marginal tax rate is 30%, that limits the deductions and exclusions to a total of $10,000. That's pretty complicated stuff. Let me say it again. A cap of 2% of adjusted gross income on the amount that you could reduce your tax payments by through deductions and exclusions would mean that if you had an adjusted gross income of $150,000, 
you could use deductions and exclusions to reduce your tax liabilities by 2% of that $150,000. That's $3,000. That means that if your marginal tax rate is 30%, that limits the deductions and exclusions to $10,000. I would apply that to all of the deductions that we have other than the charitable contribution. Because I think charitable contributions don't benefit the taxpayer, they benefit the, in the institution, the hospital, the university, the church that receives that payment. I would also apply it to the uh, current exclusion of interest on state and local bonds. I'd apply it to um, uh, employer payments for health insurance above a certain threshold. Implementing it would be relatively easy. I can come back to that if anybody wants to ask. But let me just tell you what it would mean in terms of deficit reduction. Here's the implication of a 2% cap. The increased revenue at current levels, the increased revenue, if we had that on the books now for 2013, would be $140 billion. Nearly 1% of adjusted gross income, more than 10% of our tax revenue. Over the next 10 years, that would be about $1.8 trillion, about twice what the sequester is scheduled to produce. So it's a very big revenue producer. It also is a very big simplifier, because once you think about the fact that you're limited on the amount by which you can reduce your tax liability in this way, you say, well, maybe I ought to stop itemizing and just take the standard deduction. So two-thirds of the people who now itemize would shift to the standard deduction, and only about 10% of taxpayers <coughs> would actually go through the rigmarole of itemizing. The increased taxes would rise more and proportionately more for higher income individuals. Less than 1% for those earning $30,000 to $50,000, less than 1% of their adjusted gross income while it would be 3% for those earning more than uh, $200,000. Well, I've thought about a number of variants of this method, but I think the basic idea of a cap is a way of shrinking government spending that now goes through the tax system, a way that would improve incentives and also would simplify the way we deal with our tax payments. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to your questions and to our discussion with Bell and Bill. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank seminars at Steamboat, uh, Kate Hawk and Bell Sahil for the invitation to be here. Uh, Bell mentioned that uh, I followed her as VP of the Economic Studies program at the Brookings Institution, and then she went on to uh, uh, inappropriately editorialize that <laughs> she left me all the problems and I cleaned them up. In fact, it was pretty much the opposite. Bell did the hard stuff, and I was able to coast for my three years uh, in tenure on her coattails. So I very much appreciate that, uh, and I would have come out to Colorado even if she hadn't done that for me, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's always a pleasure to be here, uh, as if one does not need additional reasons uh, to come to Steamboat uh, in the summer. So uh, I want to follow up uh, on Marty's comments. Uh, 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 I very much like the idea in principle of the, of the uh, cap on tax expenditures that he discussed. The devil, of course, is in the details, and we can talk about that if, if you want. But I, I want to talk about tax reform more generally uh, in, my, in my few minutes. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, one reason I like coming to Colorado is my son lives in Colorado Springs, and so I use the last three days to visit him. Uh, he uh, uh, detests economics and social policy. Uh, <laughs> he, he is an engineer, though, and he is cursed with a mind that makes him think like an economist, whether he likes it or not. So we were talking about this talk, and I was going through what I was going to say, and he was like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. What is tax reform? So I thought, actually, that's a really good question. And I thought I would start with that and then talk about reasons uh, why you might uh, want tax reform. 
So the canonical definition of tax reform, if you ask an economist, is broaden the base and lower the rates. Broadening the base means uh, 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 taking all the exemptions, exclusions, deductions, credits, uh, allowances, et cetera, squeezing them out of the system, what, what, what Marty called tax expenditures, squeezing them out of the system, taking that revenue, using it to lower rates so that uh, in the ideal system, everything is taxed at the same low rate. So the tax system does not distort people's choices about uh, how to earn their income, how to save their money, how to spend their money, et cetera. If you think about the current system, we're very far away from that. We have a narrow base uh, and we have rates that, that go up fairly high. Uh, so because of this canonical definition, it's often said that economists pretty much agree on tax reform. And uh, I think that's a misnomer. Uh, the two things economists don't agree on is uh, how high should taxes be and who should pay them. Other than that, we're in, we're in pretty much agreement. And uh, uh, so, so there is a tax reform debate that happens in the economics uh, profession, and there's a tax reform debate that happens in the wider world. Uh, in the wider world, these issues of how high taxes should be, who, ta who should pay them, uh, obviously are first order concerns. So let me talk about four reasons uh, why you might want tax reform and what policies they would suggest would be appropriate. Uh, the first reason is revenue. Uh, Marty, uh, I agree with everything Marty said about uh, fiscal policy, the outlook for the federal debt, uh, and the need to get that under control. Uh, it's hard to believe that currently legislated levels of revenues will be enough in the long run uh, to finance the government, even with cuts. We've got the retirement of the baby boomers. We've got health care costs rising, we have uh, increased defense and homeland security after 9-11. Uh, and uh, if you look at the forecast closely, you'll see that net interest payments are expected to sort of spiral out of control uh, over the next 25 years. So uh, there's an, in my view at least, there's a need for more revenue. Uh, public opinion supports mixed com combinations of taxes and spending as uh, ways to resolve the fiscal situation rather than an all-tax or an all-spending outcome. Uh, the notion that we can cut government spending politically without also raising taxes is a notion called starve the beast. Uh, the idea is if you deprive the government of revenues, eventually it will be forced to cut back on its spending. Ronald Reagan talked about this in the early 80s. He said if you take away a teenager's allowance, he will be forced to cut back on his spending. That is absolutely accurate. As a father of two former teenagers, I can tell you that's absolutely accurate. However, it fails if the teenager uh, can borrow unlimited amounts in world capital markets with the, uh, with the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And so in the 1980s, when we cut, spend, when we cut taxes, spending actually rose. Uh, in the 1990s, when we raised taxes, spending fell. And then the last decade, the 2001, so we cut taxes and spending rose again. That's all the opposite of the starve of the beast hypothesis. If we want to get this fiscal situation under control, I think we're going to need contributions from both the tax side uh, and the spending side. So what would you look for uh, on the tax side if you were looking at ways to raise revenues? Well, Marty's proposal on tax expenditures is, would be a great first step. Uh, if you wanted to broaden the base, the broaden the debate beyond the income tax, the two obvious huge just sitting out there candidates are a value added tax and a carbon tax. Uh, the value added tax, uh, uh, as Marty mentioned, a unique feature of our uh, international tax system uh, in that we're the only country in the world that does that. Uh, we're also the only major country in the world that does not have a value added tax. And uh, 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 Winston Churchill once said that you can always, something like, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've attempted everything else. <laughs> and um, I think that's, that's my current attitude toward the value added tax. It's the right thing to do for a number of reasons. Uh, we are nowhere near that in a political sense, but eventually when we try everything else, after we try everything else, we're gonna say, oh geez, there's this, there's this value added tax out there that could solve some of our uh, fiscal issues. A carbon tax, uh, again, will, wouldn't raise anywhere near as much money as, as a value-added tax, but it would probably raise a percent of output 
in revenue and uh, would have the added advantage uh, of making the economy more efficient. I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, I, want, I do want to mention, though, that any efforts to raise revenue uh, run into this thing called the No New Taxes Pledge, which has been signed by something like 90, 95 percent of the Republican members in Congress, and it basically rules out, uh, uh, with no contingencies, uh, uh, any uh, increase in net revenues. So the proposal that Marty made would be voted down by the entire Republican uh, party, or at least the 90% the of it that, that signed uh, that document. Uh, I personally think that, that document, it, signing that document is fiscally irresponsible, and I can go through why the people who have signed it have actually voted overwhelmingly for other tax cuts and for other spending increases uh, and have not figured out a way to finance those. Uh, but behind the no new taxes idea is the idea that Starve the Beast works. And uh, as I just mentioned, I think Starve the Beast does not work. The last 30 years suggest it's not work. So I think the increase in revenues uh, is a first order concern for the tax system. Uh, you can get there through restricting tax expenditures. You can get there through a value added tax. You can get there through a carbon tax. Uh, I, my guess is we will, let, we, will lead, we will need at least two of those three items. All right. The second reason uh, to consider tax reform is to make the economy more efficient, to make it grow faster. Uh, Marty already talked about the efficiency within the income tax, uh, so I will skip that and talk instead about this notion of taxing externalities. Uh, the, the, um, one of the few cases in which a tax makes an economic outcome a better outcome uh, uh, is in a situation where there's an externality, is where when someone is imposing a cost on someone else, uh, that is not absorbed by the market uh, cost of the transaction. The canonical example is pollution, uh, global warming uh, uh, as well. And in those situations, a tax on activities that generate pollution or generate global warming can help offset uh, the fact that the person producing the pollution is not uh, incorporating the total societal cost of that activity. A carbon tax, therefore, uh, is actually favored by most economists. Most economists also like gasoline taxes, which uh, appear to be one of the most hated taxes uh, among the population. Uh, but it would make markets more efficient, uh, not less efficient. Uh, usually with taxes, what we try to do is minimize the damage they create. Uh, this would actually create positive uh, economic effects. It would make the market more efficient, uh, and it would raise revenues. So if we want more efficiency, uh, besides broadening the base, lowering the rates, as Marty talked about, we need to think seriously about taxing externalities uh, with the obvious candidate there being, being a carbon tax. Uh, the other reason in this category is making the economy grow faster. Uh, I would caution you not to expect too much from tax reform uh, on the aggregate growth rate. Uh, occasionally we have political candidates that say, I'm going to make the economy grow at 5% percent, and that's going to solve all of our concerns, and uh, you kind of sit there and go, oh, wow, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we've, had, we've had enormous variations in the top rate. Uh, the top rate came down from the 90s and the 60s to, the 70, to around 70 uh, before Ronald Reagan took office. It came down to 28 percent, as Marty mentioned, uh, in stages, ultimately in 1986. Uh, uh, we did not get increased growth uh, out of that experiment. We did get increased growth later in the 90s, but that was after we had raised the top rate to 39.6. This is not an argument that raising the top rate to 39.6 raised the growth rate, but certainly it didn't get in the way of the growth rate. And uh, the lower rates, the vastly lower rates we've had uh, the last 20, 30 years compared to the 50s, 60s, 70s has not resulted in an economy that, that's grown faster. Uh, we had a tax cut in 2001 that uh, these days nobody talks about as having stimulated the growth rate. We had subpar, subpar growth from 01 to 07, uh, and then, of course, the Great Recession. But even from 01 to 07, the growth that did occur uh, was in housing and, and the financial sector and was due to low interest rates. Uh, I am not aware of anyone making a serious argument that the, the, the tax cut of 2001 uh, had any impact on the growth rate. Uh, and then the biggest, the biggest issue here is World War II, uh, 
uh, we went from being a permanent low tax country, uh, I guess permanent is not the right word, we went from a long standing low tax, low tax, low spending country before the war uh, to after the war, uh, revenues and spending were raised by 10% of GDP permanently. Marginal tax rates went up, the corporate tax rate went up, individual rates went up, uh, payroll taxes went up. Uh, if you plug that into any model, you'd, you'd have a disaster on your hands. Uh, in fact, we had 25 years of robust growth after that. Uh, again, it's not, the argument is not that the, increase, the, that the massive increase in taxes then caused that increase in growth, but it certainly did not get in the way of that increase in growth. So I, I think most of the discussion of taxes and growth is just vastly overstated. The economy has a way of chugging along on its own, and a few percentage points on the marginal rate will not make that big a difference. The best way fiscal policy can affect growth is to get the fiscal house in order. And this comes back to what Marty was saying earlier. The, the corrosive effects of debt on uh, long-term economic activity are substantial. Uh, there, you, you, you don't need a crisis to have these gradual effects. A colleague of mine talks about termites in the woodwork eating away at the foundation of the capital stock over time. And most models that calibrate the effects of that suggest that the negative effects of debt expansion in the long term are much larger than the positive effects of, of uh, tax reform. All right, the, the third reason you might want tax reform is to make the system f f more equitable or fairer. Uh, it's often said that fairness is in the eyes of the beholder, and that is definitely the case. Uh, at, the one, at the low end of the income distribution, you've got 47% of the population that pays no income taxes. Uh, they do pay other taxes, but they don't pay income taxes. They are not cheating the system. They're just using the provisions of the code that Congress uh, added. Uh, at the top end of the distribution, you've got the top 1%. Over the last 30 years, their income has skyrocketed in absolute terms and uh, relative to the rest of the population yet their average tax rate has gone down uh, uh, with, by the way, with no effect on, on the, the expansion rate of the economy, uh, just an increase in their after-tax income. Again, like low-income households, they aren't evading, they aren't cheating the tax system, they're just using the rules uh, that Congress put in the code. So you could argue both that low-income households don't pay enough taxes and that high-income households don't pay enough taxes, and guess what? Uh, tax rates for the middle class have gone down as well over the last 30 years. Uh, so you might think, oh, well, that's great. Every, everybody's better off. Uh, the only people that aren't are the future generations. Uh, uh, we, have a, we have a political system that is designed explicitly to protect minority interests uh, with checks and balances and so on. Uh, but the biggest, mi the largest minority interest, if that's not an oxymoron here, is future generations who have no say, no voice in the process and the fairness of the tax system. Uh, and then you have, um, all across the income spectrum, you have this feature that different forms of income, different forms of consumption uh, uh, are taxed at different ways. This is a phenomenon that economists call horizontal inequity. Uh, so if you want to pursue fairness in the tax system, uh, you have a wealth of targets uh, at the high end, at the low end, uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, similar situated people and current generations versus future generations. I'm sure we'll come back to that, so I'll, I'll move to my last point, which is making the tax system simpler. Uh, everybody wants a simple system. I've spent a fair amount of time working on simplification, and it's a really interesting issue in tax policy because we have these enormous debates over how high taxes should be, who should pay them, what the marginal tax rate should be, what we should do expenditures. There's disagreement on every single issue in the tax system, except Everybody thinks the system is too complicated and everybody wants a simpler system. Yet, think about this, every year the system gets more complicated. Um, simplification is ever the bridesmaid, never the bride uh, in policy. It's always passed over uh, in favor of some other goal. Uh, and there's two, ways, there's two ways to see this. One is if you ask yourself how much more not less, how much more would you be willing to pay in taxes to, to avoid all complications of tax filing? Uh, for most people, the, I would surmise the answer is close to zero. And, and what that means is they're not valuing having a simpler system. Everyone would sort of pays lip service to it, 
but, but it's not clear to me that people really value it in the sense that they're willing to give things up in order to get it. Uh, the other uh, aspect of simplification I'll just mention is um, Bell mentioned that Chairman Camp and Chairman Baucus uh, went on a listening or are working on tax reform. The New York Times reported that they went on a listening tour recently and they asked people what, what they should do. And there's a dictum, I guess, in the legal profession that you should never ask a question unless you already know the answer, but, uh, or the, know the answer that you're going to get, not, the, not know the correct answer. Uh, one woman responded to the question, what should they do, by saying, you should get rid of all of the deductions that don't affect me. <laughs> so people are very happy to make other people's taxes less complicated, but they much prefer to uh, keep the deductions that affect themselves. Uh, and so, uh, I don't mean to be flippant, but I'm, uh, if, if your goal is to get a simple tax system, a postcard tax system, uh, my advice would be get a dog, take up a hobby, uh, find something that you can do successfully. I, I, I am extremely pessimistic that we can ever vastly simplify uh, the American tax system. All right, let me just close with, with uh, a classic joke. There's a one inmate in a jailhouse says, uh, boy, the food here is not very good. And the other one says, yeah, and there's not enough of it. <laughs> and and that, is, that is basically an accurate description of our tax system. Thank you. Uh, terrific presentations, and um, we are going to have Q&A from the audience. So as you know, if you've been here before, there will be some cards that the ushers will pass around, and they will come to the front and uh, get passed up to me to ask the speakers. So be thinking what you'd like to ask. And also, uh, both Marty and Bill are very broad-gauged and very knowledgeable economists on all kinds of issues. So feel free to ask about anything in the economic realm. You don't have to ask just about taxes. But I want to start with a question for Marty that was catalyzed by something that Bill said. Uh, as Bill said, a lot of people are, uh, including me, are great fans of this proposal that Marty has put forward to cap or limit deductions. And Marty, you talked about devoting the revenue to reducing the deficit and the debt. And I think, and Bill, when he talked about uh, tax reform, said the canonical version of it was to broaden the base, get rid of a lot of those backdoor spending items, and lower rates. You didn't say anything about lowering rates. You seem to imply that we should take all of the revenue from reducing tax expenditures and use it for deficit reduction, but I want to clarify that. What would you say about that? So I would certainly want to use some of it for rate reduction and some of it for deficit and, and debt reduction. On both the corporate and the personal side, the reducing rates. Uh, on the, well, yes, yeah, the, you corporate, made the, point the, corporate on the corporate side, side I started by right. saying, and I think that's where the president uh, is also on that. But on the personal side, I would like to see a cap on expenditures uh, and the real question that uh, related to what you just asked that Bill raised is how do you get Republicans on board right, with that? Right, right. Let's discuss so I'm a, that. I am a Republican, and I say to my Republican friends, you say you want to reduce the deficit by cutting spending. And I agree with that. Some of that has to be slowing the growth of entitlements, but there's not a lot that you can get through the, the traditional... Um, bits of annually appropriated discretionary spending. So I keep trying to persuade them with some growing success that these tax expenditures really are spending. So it shows up if you get rid of a tax expenditure, if, if you limit it, if you cap it, uh, that will show up as additional revenue, but in reality it's a change in government spending. So I think that if we can get Republicans over that hurdle, then the pledge that Bill talked about, they can say, there's tax increases and tax increases. 
or put it differently, there are tax rate increases and revenue increases that really are the result of cutting spending. And these are spending cuts, and they happen to show up because of the way we do our accounts. They happen to show up on the revenue side of the budget, but they're really spending cuts. And I think that's a critical distinction that if we can get a political understanding of, we can move forward with this. Okay, so Marty's proposal here is to limit deductions, uh, use some of the revenue to reduce rates and some of the revenue to um, reduce the deficit. And there is a political uh, barrier right now, but as he argues, we might be able to get around that. Uh, Bill has talked about a value-added tax and pointed out that most other advanced countries have a very serious value-added tax. As I recall, the average rate in Europe is 17, 18 percent, something like that. Uh, so value-added tax, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is like a national sales tax. So when you go out and buy something, everything you buy, you pay this rate on. So it discourages consumption and may encourage savings. Uh, but, you know, Larry Summers once quipped about the value-added tax that conservatives don't like it because they view it as a money machine. It produces a lot of revenue, uh, particularly the kind of rates they have in Europe, and it enables uh, other countries to reduce uh, other taxes. Uh, but liberals don't like it either because it tends to be regressive, meaning, you know, the poor, because they have to consume more of their income on necessities, end up paying higher taxes than the wealthy, who don't get taxed at all on their, the part of their income that they save. Uh, Larry Summers said, well, we will get a value-added tax once conservatives understand that it is regressive and uh, liberals understand that it is a money machine. Um, just couldn't resist getting that into the conversation here. Uh, Marty, I think you don't like a value-added tax, but I'm not sure. What do you think about a value-added tax? If you could substitute a value-added tax for almost any other part of our tax structure, I would say that's great. But the experience around the world is it's not substituted, it's additive. So we have a tax system in the U.S., federal, state, and local, that taxes about 33% of total income of gross domestic product. In Europe, it's 50-55%. And the reason for that, I think, is the value-added tax. And, and Bill made the important point that roughly half of people who file tax returns pay no taxes. And if you put a value-added tax in place, you'd have to come up with some complicated system of sending them checks in the mail or I don't know what in order not to greatly increase their burden. So I think that's a serious problem with the value-added tax. You want to say more about the value-added tax bill? Sure. Uh, I love Summer's quote. Uh, the uh, only problem is it's it's misleading. Uh, uh, the VAT and the studies. Uh, there's an issue of whether it's you know generated this vast expanse of European government. Uh, the issues. The evidence suggests that that happened in the 70s, which was a very inflationary time. But that over the last 30 years. Uh, it's had pretty much no impact. Uh, and then the issue, of, so that's the money machine aspect. The other aspect of the money machine I'll mention is we're doing this because we need revenues. We agree we need revenues. It's a question of how to come up with, with the revenues. So the part of the money machine uh, is a good thing. Uh, on the regressive part, the, the question is always compared to what? And uh, if you look at, say, the Republican budget, which wants to cut uh, Medicare, Medicaid dramatically, uh, other government spending dramatically, uh, uh, having a VAT that maintains those uh, would arguably be uh, a progressive change relative to eliminating those changes. I mean, European countries generally have more progressive systems, especially at the low end of the income distribution, than we do despite the fact that they have the VAT. So, so uh, uh, I think uh, on a related point, uh, it's easy. Uh, we, you often get in a situation of tax reform where people talk about these really elegant solutions that only exist on paper and have never existed anywhere in the world. 
and the the problem with them, of course, is implementing them. Uh, the, the one of the ver another virtue of the value added tax is it exists. We know it works. We know uh, you know uh, it's not a perfect tax. There, there are administrative issues, but but implementing a system that has been worked out where the details have been worked out uh, is much easier than starting uh, you know sp starting from scratch from like some whole new system. So so I think the value added tax both has a lot to offer and uh, the problems it creates are uh, surmountable. So it reminds me of your final joke, though, about the two guys in jail. You said the value-added tax is not a source of increased revenue, but in any case, we do need more revenue, so that's why we ought to have a value-added tax. Yeah, well, there's, there's uh, <laughs> I, I, I cut short the discussion. The, the, <laughs> the argument is whether the money, the money machine argument, and thank you for asking because I, I think I stated it right. The money machine argument is whether the value added tax causes spending to rise. And I'm saying the evidence from Europe since the last 30 years is it does not cause spending to rise. Okay, that it does, obviously it raises revenue, but it's not causing spending to rise. So it's, 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 uh, uh, it's solving the fiscal solution. I mean, you have the same problem with any source of revenue. Uh, uh, and this comes back to the whole Star of the Beast notion and solving the fiscal problem. Uh, and I certainly, I mean, I, I think that's a first order issue, but, but uh, the VAT can be as much a part of the solution as any other revenue interest. I was uh, interested in uh, your proposal, Marty, that you uh, exempted from these, from your cap, uh, charitable contributions and uh, interest on municipals, if I understood you right. No, the other way around. I, I would not apply the cap to the charitable deduction. I would allow the charitable deduction to remain. Everybody would get as much of that as they want. But I would include as a tax expenditure the current exclusion of interest. Oh, sorry, yes. So it okay. would be a, something on which people would have to fit within that 2% right. of AGI cap. And Bill, how do you feel about whether there should be any um, exemptions from the limits? And, you know, if we think ab uh, about, um, I mean, I think it makes huge sense to just have an overall limit for the reason that Marty suggested, which is otherwise we'll have huge political food fights about the different deductions, and every interest will be at the table fighting to keep them. And you have an overall limit, you kind of get around that problem, at least to some extent. But I'm wondering if, some, if either one of you wants to uh, talk further about which are the most egregious tax expenditures, backdoor spending programs, and which are the least egregious. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, sure. The, the, so there's several issues here. The first thing is that people tend to describe the tax expenditures as loopholes. Uh, loopholes are you know, things, things that other people get. Incentives are things that you get. Uh, uh, most of these things, the big ones, have been around since longer than Social Security. And they're, the, you know, the, charitable interest, the charitable deduction is taken by almost 40 million people. The mortgage interest deduction is taken by 35 million people. So they're, they're, these, are, these are like major elements of American economic and social policy, not, not, um, not loopholes. Uh, in terms of what goes into the cap, uh, there will inevitably be arguments uh, about what should be included. Uh, uh, one of the things I think Marty wants to exclude are all the saving, the tax expenditures for saving, uh, which will get a fair amount of Play. I know the, the, but so if you include, if you include health insurance, for example, in the cap, then you're going to knock out uh, uh, most middle class households' ability to use anything else. Uh, if if there's an, also an issue of how the cap rises or changes with respect to income, and then there's this issue about what's included. So uh, I, again, I think it provides a framework, a good framework, uh, for. Uh, Progressive ways and efficient ways uh, to raise revenue, uh, but but there are a lot of details in there. Uh, in terms of the most egregious, let me let me just let me just say I'm going to stick the mortgage interest deduction out there. Uh, 
uh, in, in a well-designed income tax, all forms of income would be taxed and interest payments would be uh, a deduction because they're a cost of earning the income. Uh, in our current system, we don't tax housing, uh, owner-occupied housing under the income tax, uh, except when it's sold at capital gains, we don't tax the imputed income flow every year. So there's no reason to give uh, the interest deduction for mortgage payments. Uh, and uh, the notion that it increases home ownership uh, or that it was put there to increase home ownership uh, are just not right. And uh, uh, the, I think it actually, to the extent that it encouraged people to take on higher loan to value ratios, uh, it actually made the financial crisis worse because uh, it put more households underwater and it put those that were underwater farther underwater. Uh, so, uh, so far the, so far the clouds haven't, the sky hasn't opened and, you know, claps of thunder or anything, but I would put mortgage interest deduction way up there. Marty, let me move to the corporate tax, which I thought your comments uh, about were terribly interesting. Uh, as you noted, the president has also called for a reduction in the corporate rate from 35% to I'm not sure what, 28, 28. 28. And I think uh, from what I read, he is talking about trying to pay for it by limiting corporate deductions, as you also suggested. He also has said he would only do this if he could have some increased spending on infrastructure, job training, and maybe one or two other things. And that that's the deal that he's put on the table. Um, do you think anybody will take that deal? Is there ru any room for... Well, well there's uh, a lot of interest in the business community in getting the first part of the deal. The <laughs> part of the deal, including, including a willingness to give up the accelerated depreciation and uh, uh, last-in, first-out inventory treatment, which, as I said, was very important when you have very high inflation, very high interest rates, but now it's much less uh, of an issue for businesses. Um, the president has said very little about uh, what he would do about the tax treatment of foreign profits. And I think that's the... The, the sleeper the, issue The here. sleeper issue, which could produce a lot of revenue which could be used to pay for the um, uh, infrastructure and manpower training. So what's happened over the years is companies, for the incentive reasons that I talked about, have left very large amounts of profits overseas. They invested in new businesses, they expanded their foreign businesses, they hold a lot of cash. There's probably about $2 trillion worth of, of profits of American companies that are overseas that have never been taxed. So what might the president say? He might say, he hasn't said he would say it, but he might say, I'll make you a deal. Um, I'll let you bring it all back, uh, and anything you generate in the future, subject to a tax of, say, 10%. Um, and you don't have to pay it all right now, but you've got to pay it over the next 10 years. Well, 10% of Two trillion dollars, two hundred billion dollars. The way Congress does its accounts, it doesn't care what happens this year and next year. It looks at right. ten years. Right, right. So here we've got ten years worth of money, and the president rightly could say, "But we've got a short run problem where a two, three year major infrastructure spending program and manpower training program would help the economy a lot, and we would collect this other revenue." over a 10-year period, and they'd balance out in terms of their impact on the national debt. That would be pretty attractive. Yeah. That would be pretty attractive. Uh, speaking of Congress, I'm going to throw out a more political question, and then I'm going to turn to some of the questions from the audience. But before I do that, uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that uh, we're all uh, clear about is, uh, I think you said, uh, maybe both of you said 47% of the public doesn't pay income taxes, but they do pay, I think you said this, Marty, I just want to emphasize it because I find so many people don't think about this. They pay payroll taxes, which can be, you know, if you count in the fact that your wages are likely to be a little lower because your employer has to pay a tax mm 
uh, into the Social Security system on your behalf, in addition to what you have to pay, it can be about 15% of your income. Do we all agree on that? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so here is the uh, more political question. <laughs> we have three fiscal crises that are looming this fall. The first is the need to fund the government on October 1st when current funding runs out and a new fiscal year begins. The second is what to do about this sequester, uh, the, off, the across the board spending cuts that are about a uh, trillion dollars roughly over 10 years. Uh, the third is what to do when the government runs up against the debt ceiling again which, uh, according to most estimates, is probably going to be late October, early November. Uh, and these are huge issues uh, in which there is an impasse right now between the parties and between the Congress and the White House. And tax reform could be one of the um, negotiating elements in trying to deal with those three issues. So I think I'd like each of you to comment on these looming fiscal crises uh, and whether they interact with tax reform or anything else you'd like to say more broadly about how we deal with these crises and what happens if we can't deal with them. Uh, the three crises you mentioned are uh, politically manufactured crises. They're not real crises. Uh, the <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, uh, Everybody here loves the Congress of the U.S., clearly. <laughs> yes. uh, the obvious okay. Okay. solution is to continue funding the government at current levels, uh, raise the debt ceiling, or find some way to, to suspend it like they did in the spring. Uh, and and uh, I'm pretty sure that's where they'll get to uh, after all the, the huffing and puffing. I don't think the Republicans actually, I don't think that the, the, the moderate part of the Republican Party wants to shut the government down. Uh, uh, nobody, well, not no, certainly the moderate part of the Republican Party does not want the U.S. to default on its debt. Uh, uh, and so, this is, these are easily solvable problems. They're just making a lot of noise. Politically difficult. Marty. I agree with both of those. I think the sequester is a more serious problem. Um, the sequester falls 50% on the military, and the other 50% divided a little bit on entitlements, and the rest on the annually appropriated programs. And with respect to the military, um, because of the way the sequester has been structured, it's doing a great deal of damage because there are no layoffs of, of um, military servicemen, uh, so it all comes in terms of preparedness, uh, readiness, uh, uh, investments in equipment and maintenance, and um, it's a terrible mess. So even if they keep the sequester and keep it at the current level, they should allow, and this is the administration's proposal as well, they should allow, within the sequester uh, limits, they should allow the um, uh, Defense Department to restructure the way in which it saves money. I have a whole bunch of questions here from the audience, not surprisingly, about what's the political feasibility of anything we've talked about up here. <laughs> Uh, your proposal, Marty, the value-added tax which Bill favors, um, any kind of compromise on these sets of fiscal and tax policy issues? It's very hard to say. I am an optimist. I believe that we are facing a very serious fiscal problem and that uh, tax reform can be part of it, that it can produce simplification, which people like, it can produce some lower rates, and it can produce additional revenue. The hang-up is in coming to recognize that these tax expenditures really are spending. They're not loopholes, but they are spending. 
And so if you want to reduce government spending, that's where you have to look. And I think if the Republicans will come over there and the Democrats say, we want to see some additional revenue in this package, well, there's revenue, but it's the revenue that comes from reducing tax expenditures. Uh, so we have a question about the alternative minimum tax, which um, I don't think either one of you really addressed. Uh, so what is the AMT and uh, what, are the, what is the likelihood of repealing it or at least indexing it for inflation? Uh, it is in, the alternative minimum tax is uh, basically a separate, uh, a second, like a parallel tax system to the regular income tax. Uh, uh, trying to say this as non-pejoratively as possible. If you get, if you have too many deductions relative to your income, uh, you get kicked onto the AMT, and then you get, uh, it's, it's sort of a way to, to limit the total amount of sheltering you can do in certain ways. Uh, uh, and uh, it recently was indexed for inflation. For a long time it was not. In the, at the Tax Act at the beginning of this year, it was indexed. Uh, it, it, the AMT has all sorts of problems. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, limit the capital gains and dividends. Uh, it tends, which are the shelter, where the sheltering is, it, it tends to go after uh, big families and families in states with high income taxes, uh, which is nobody's definition of, of uh, uh, tax sheltering. People in New York that have big families pay lower federal income tax than people in Texas with small families. Uh, the AMT picks up that lower income tax as a form of, quote, sheltering, unquote, and kicks the New York family onto the AMT. That was not the intended effect. The intended effect originally was to limit capital gains and sheltering and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So everyone wants to get rid of the AMT, uh, except that uh, it would cost about a trillion dollars a decade uh, to do so. Uh, and so we're, right now we're stuck with it. Uh, presumably, if, if and when there is uh, a broad-based tax reform, uh, it will involve abolition of the AMT. The AMT. The existence of the AMT in the first place is an acknowledgement that the current system is not taxing what we want it <coughs> to tax. So the right thing to do would be to fix the current system rather than to add on uh, uh, a second system. The great thing about the cap that I described, it basically eliminates the need for the AMT. So if you have the cap, you don't need an AMT to pick up revenue because almost nobody would be subject to the AMT under current rules if they were subject to a 2% cap. Um, interesting. The president, uh, this person says, has offered a uh, broad outline of cor corporate tax reform, as we just discussed, but he's been silent on um, reform of the personal income tax. Uh, could you comment, Marty, on the importance of harmonizing the two systems? I, I don't think the harmonization of the two systems is that significant. Um, uh, I think that we're not going to see any progress on the personal income tax uh, in the next two years. The president has said he's not going to raise any revenue on anybody earning less than $250,000. So uh, he would block the kind of cap proposal that I have, even though it raises substantially more revenue from high income, it does raise some revenue from lower income individuals and uh, it's hard to imagine the Republicans agreeing to a cap just for higher income individuals because you could never come back and do it for the rest because that would just be a pure tax increase on middle and lower income individuals. So unless the president, uh, as part of some grand bargain, says yes, we'll do a cap and it'll be fair because it'll affect everybody, uh, unless we get that, I don't think we see anything on the personal income tax. Uh, Bill, um, we did not talk, neither one of you talked about the so-called flat tax. This inevitably comes up in every audience I've ever dealt with. Uh, I know you've got some comments on it. Would you talk about the flat tax? Sure. The flat tax is a value-added tax 
that is split into two parts, one at the business level, one at the individual level. Uh, it's designed or it's intended by its creators uh, to replace the income and corporate tax, uh, whereas the VAT I was talking about was an add-on. Uh, uh, and the, there are issues with implementing it as a uh, standalone tax. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cleverly named tax because the interesting thing about it from an economic perspective is what the base is. And it's a value-added tax, so it's a consumption tax. It's split into two parts, so neither part looks like a value-added tax. Uh, uh, but the system as a whole would tax value-added, would tax consumption. Uh, it's the, when I was referring earlier to systems that look elegant on paper, but have never been implemented anywhere. Uh, that was the one I had in mind. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, I, I think all economists think it's a very clever creation, uh, uh, but it, it, it would be relative to our current system, relative to our revenue needs. I don't think it would raise the revenue needed uh, uh, to deal with the fiscal situation. I have two questions here. Um, one I'm going to give to Marty because it's addressed specifically uh, to him and one to you, Bill. The one for M Marty is, uh, what's your authority for the statement that higher tax rates discourage more working and more productivity? Well, if you look at the, um, at the evidence, the, the best experiment that we've had <clears throat> was what happened after the 1986 um, tax reform. This was a bipartisan tax reform that was designed to be revenue neutral, but to bring the top rate down from 50% to 28% and to reduce other high rates. And what we learned by following individual taxpayers, you can get detailed data on individual tax returns, anonymous tax returns, and follow them before and after <coughs> that change you see that there was a substantial increase in their taxable income. Some of that came from earning more. Some of it came from taking more of their income in taxable form rather than fringe benefits. Some of it came from using fewer tax deductions. But basically, the thing we learned from doing that was, roughly speaking, if you cut tax rates across the board by 10%, you don't reduce tax revenue by 10%, you reduce it by about 6%. So there's an increase in the tax base that comes from those three sources that I, I mentioned, more work uh, and earnings, um, more compensation in taxable form, and fewer deductions. So that's really critical <clears throat> to the tax reform discussion. Uh, this question is about uh, why we don't ask everyone in America to pay some tax. A friend of mine says that whenever he play, plays Trivial Pursuit, his, his, his opponents get questions like, which country is shaped like a boot and made Italian opera famous? And, <laughs> and he, gets, he gets questions like, what's the cube root of the distance from the sun to the Milky Way? Uh, so, uh, we, why don't we ask everyone in the country to pay tax? There's, traditionally, there's been uh, uh, an understanding ever since the income, the income tax was created in 1913 as a way of getting at high income households. It, it only applied to, I think, 2% of the population. It was during the progressive area. Era. It was explicitly intended to be a tax that went after high income households. Uh, that basically stayed that way till the Second World War when revenue needs uh, expanded greatly and it was changed in Bill Paradley's saying from a class tax to a mass tax. Uh, since then, uh, there's always been this notion that, that people who are in the poverty level or lower should not have to pay federal income tax. And then that has expanded in recent years uh, through bipartisan agreements with the earned income uh, credit, the child subsidies, uh, 
uh, to raise the threshold level of income below which someone doesn't pay any net income taxes. For a lot of people, it's, 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 they have a gross liability and then the, the subsidies net it out to, to zero. So um, these people are paying uh, payroll taxes on the first dollar that they earn. In fact, three quarters of the households in the country pay more in payroll taxes than they do in income taxes when you count the part that the, that the, work, that the firm pays. Uh, and uh, they are paying state and local taxes uh, at a fairly significant uh, level. Uh, but there's always been an understanding that households at some level and lower should be exempt from federal income taxes. What's happened, <clears throat> what's happened in the uh, recent decades is that the um, federal income tax now has refundable credits so that if your income is below a certain level, not only do you not pay any federal income tax, but you may actually get a check from the government. And that's, those are non-trivial amounts. So that while people do pay payroll tax, if your income is low enough, you may get a check from the government that offsets the amount of your payroll tax. Uh, there's so many good questions here, I can't get to all of them, but uh, one that we absolutely uh, have to get to, whether or not you all want to address it, is Yellen versus Summers for the Fed. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Man. Uh, I think we have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, I think both Yellen and Summers would be outstanding. Uh, uh, I, if you told me either one of them were appointed, I would say that's great news for the country. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Marty. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we have some two-handed economists up here. On the one hand, on the other, no decision on Yellen versus Summers. Both very good people, I agree with that as well. Well, I think it's getting uh, late, and I want to thank both Marty and Bill for being with us, and all of you as well.